Welcome to uh, Room 1 at the uh, Kent Hill uh, Centre for the uh, Space Weather Talk by Dr Colin Forsyth. Colin has been here several times, but there's always something new, even on the sun that's been there for zillions of years, isn't there? Over to you, Colin. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for everyone for coming in. First slot after lunch on the last day. That's always a bit of a killer. Um, so, space weather. What is this thing? It gets banded about, this, this terminology. I mean, we think about the weather every day. It's a bright, sunny day at the moment. We get rain. But what is this, this space weather thing? Well, space weather is the interaction between the sun and the Earth that impacts on technology. So this interaction has been going on for millions of years. The sun's been out there doing its thing. We've been sat in the way, doing our thing. But as we've started to become more reliant on technology, putting spacecraft into space, putting power lines on the ground, having you know, bits of technology that we're holding onto all the time, we become more exposed to some of these interactions between the planets and the sun. And those interactions, you know, most of the time we don't notice them, but when they get really bad, they can impact on daily lives. And that's the sort of thing we want to look at. We want to understand and we want to be able to predict. And particularly in terms of, of the radio community, amateur radio users, this can be, uh, th these interactions can really uh, make a difference between whether you're able to make transmissions, able to receive those transmissions, how good they are, and when they might be disrupted. Um, as an amateur com uh, community, that can be a problem. It can actually be a problem for professional communities as well. And I'll come on to some of that later on. But in order to, to understand this interaction, we actually need to start by understanding what the universe is made up of. Uh, and so we go back to some very basic stuff about what matter is made up of and the different states of matter. And if you go through your, your, your GCSEs and, and your A-levels, you come across the three basic states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, and this is my little demonstration as to what a, a, so uh, a, a gas looks like. Uh, I have atoms, I have a nucleus uh, that's going to have protons and neutrons in it, and I have a blue electron whizzing around the outside, and all these things are able to move around. Uh, if I could program this ever so slightly better, they would bounce off one another, but they don't. They just bounce off the edges. Um, and that's our, our simulation of a gas. And it's fairly easy to describe in terms of general terms, pressures, temperatures, densities, all of those sorts of things, um, because you know, there's really only one force or two forces that are working on this. We've got collisions between them and we've got gravity, and that's all we care about. However, there is a fourth hidden state of matter, and that is the, the, the plasma state. And when you take particles and put them into a plasma state, we get all these extra forces acting on them, and so we've got all of these extra things that can control what's going on. In order to get stuff into a plasma state, you have to strip the electrons out of the atoms. And so now I've got the same number of electrons uh, and the same number of what were um, my, my nuclei beforehand. These are now ions moving around, but they've all been separated out. And because they're separated, they, become, they have their charges. The, the, the ions are positively charged. The electrons are negatively charged. You have electric fields between them. We all know that, that like charges repel, opposite charges attract. So we've got action at a distance. We've got forces acting on these. And these particles also interact very strongly with magnetic fields. They generate magnetic fields, and they interact very strongly with those magnetic fields. So what I've done here is put a magnetic field demonstrated by the white lines going up and down the board. And you see these particles sort of gyrate about the magnetic field. And the whole thing, instead of just moving around randomly, they're sort of constrained to act in this given way. In fact, this is really important that we see um, in a lot of states of, of this matter, we see that the plasma and the magnetic field are locked together. Where one goes, the other goes. And that will become important later on. Now, the other thing about matter in this state is that if you wobble things about a little bit, you can actually induce frequencies into this state of matter. And these frequencies are important because you can actually pump the frequencies into this state of matter and get a reaction out of it. So you've got electromagnetic fields that can influence this. And so if you pump an electromagnetic field into this, you can get a reaction out of it. Uh, and one of the reactions that we get is that a sort of basic state of, of the plasma. We have this so-called plasma frequency, omega. This is the only equation I will show in this. I know people get sort of scared by equations. I'm going to show you that this isn't a scary equation. It's really quite simple. 
So th the basis of this is if you wobble the electrons a little bit, we assume that the ions are relatively fixed because they're much more massive, they don't move as easily. So we wobble the electrons a little bit, we actually get a restoring action on them, and they start to wobble back and forth at a particular frequency. And that frequency is governed by these four symbols. N, the number, amount of stuff, density, okay? E squared, the charge on an electron. This is a constant. It does not change. The universe has fixed that, uh, and so I'm going to ignore that. Um, M, the mass of the electron. This is also a constant. The universe has fixed that, so uh, I'm going to ignore that one as well. And then epsilon naught, the so-called permissivity of free space. That is also a constant, and so I'm going to ignore that. And so you can see that my density is the only thing that drives the frequency at which this plasma wants to oscillate. Now, if you pump an electric field into that at that same frequency, then you're going to get an interaction within that, and you can then get that electric field essentially re-radiated by the plasma, and you get reflection effects. And this is the sort of thing that we see in the upper atmosphere of our Earth. Because the upper atmosphere of the Earth is actually in a plasma state. It's not just a gas all the way up. We get to a certain point, and then we get these, this plasma uh, arising. So where does this plasma come from? The plasma actually comes from the sun, or from the action of the sun. This diagram shows you how opaque our atmosphere is to different wavelengths. Okay, you've got your whole electromagnetic spectrum, we've got the radio stuff right down the bottom, that's long wavelengths. We've got gamma waves and x-rays and things like that up here, these are the short wavelengths. And this bar, or this, this colored area, basically shows you whether or not our atmosphere lets this stuff come through. And it turns out our atmosphere lets through the visible light, that's kind of handy, that allows us to see. Uh, we get some infrared stuff coming down. We've got a nice big radio window for the radio astronomers. But we've got this region where basically our atmosphere absorbs the stuff coming in. And when it absorbs that stuff, particularly at these short wavelengths, those wavelengths have enough energy that they can change the state of matter of our upper atmosphere. Okay? So all these things, so the ultraviolet, the x-rays, all that sort of stuff coming into our upper atmosphere changes the upper atmosphere. How does it do that? It simply strips the electrons out of, uh, of the, the atoms that are up there. So we have our neutral atom. Uh, we've got our red and blue again. Our little electron's going to whiz round. And then we have some light coming in. And if that light has the right amount of energy, it can actually come in, energize that electron, and strip it right out of the atom. Now we have our positively charged ion again, our negatively charged electron. We have matter in that plasma state. And that happens over and over and over and over and over again until we have this layer of plasma sat in our upper atmosphere. And that is the layer that is really important for you guys. If any of you are operating on HF, then when you're on the day side of the Earth, you get these, uh, the energy from the sun coming in, energizing the upper atmosphere, causing the so-called F layer at high altitude. You can reflect signals of, you know, in the megahertz range, so, you know, one to, to 30 odd megs, you can, you can get reflected off that. Now, why is that sort of thing important? And, you know, if that was all that was going on, I could stop this talk right here and we'll be done. Actually, well, let's just show some radio waves bouncing around. So why is this sort of thing important? Well, to misquote aha, the sun always shines. However, the sun doesn't always shine at the same brightness. The sun actually changes its brightness, and particularly in those ultraviolet and X-ray wavelengths, we see a lot of dynamics in the brightness of the sun. So let's look at the sun. Obviously, we do not look directly at the sun. Okay, you do not go outside and look directly at the sun. You use specialist equipment. Uh, this is a piece of specialist equipment in orbit of the Earth called the Sol Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, and this is looking at the, the sun in a visible wavelength, actually from uh, 2012. The instruments have, have suffered a lot, little bit since then. Uh, and this particular wave band isn't quite as clear anymore. Uh, 
However, in visible wavelengths, the sun is quite round. A little bit bland, you might say. There's a few wee spots on it, but that's about it. But if we change wavelengths, if we look at the wavelength in, say, an ultraviolet wavelength, then we see all of this activity on the sun. The sun is a giant ball of that plasma stuff that I talked about right at the start. And because of that, we get activity, we get these bursts of magnetic fields coming out of the solar surface, we get light spots, we get bright spots, we get dark regions, we get all this stuff which changes the amount of emissivity that you get in different layers of the sun, at uh, different wavelengths, and that can impact on our atmosphere. Now, one of the things with the sun, the sun is, well, it's, it's a plasma, we call it a, you know, it's a fluid, and it spins. Does anyone know the spin rate of the sun? How often does this? Go on, shout it out. Plus or minus. Because it turns out that different bits of the sun are going around at different speeds. Okay? When you've got a big solid ball and you rotate it round, everything goes round at the same rate. If you've got a fluid, if you've got something that's in a gas state, a plasma state, even a liquid state in a ball, and you spin it, it turns out the stuff at the equator is going to go much, much quicker than the stuff at the poles. Now, you remember that I said that this plasma state, the magnetic field, is locked into the plasma. And so what happens on the sun is that as the equator goes faster and faster and faster, the magnetic field of the sun gets wrapped up, and it changes over time, and it starts to... to erupt out, we get these little bursts of the magnetic field coming out, it rises up through the solar atmosphere, and we get those eruptions of, of uh, sunspots and things like that, where the magnetic field of the sun actually pops up, holds some of that plasma around, and that leads to all sorts of other activity that eventually tries to get the sun back to where it was in the first place in this almost like a dipolar configuration of a magnetic field. So that plasma state is incredibly important for how the sun works. And what this gives us is actually a sort of cyclical activity within the sun, the so-called solar cycle. Uh, and this is a, a set of images from the SOHO spacecraft uh, that's been operating since 1996. So this is actually fantastic that we've got this, this long-term data set. And you can see the sun was quite bland. So this is an, an ultraviolet wavelength again. There wasn't a lot going on in 1996. As we move through to 2003, there was an awful lot of activity. We reached up to solar maximum. We came through 2008, 2009. It was quite quiet. And then we've gone through another cycle as the activity has gone up. And we're just actually coming out of the, the minimum point uh, of a, a cycle now. Activity is starting to creep up on the sun. Uh, and we're starting to see uh, the, these bands of sunspot uh, ar arise again. So this, this solar cycle happens over around about 11 years. And we've seen this. We've got data looking at this going way, way, way back, you know, back into the 1600s. Because although these bright spots appear as bright spots in the ultraviolet, they appear as dark spots if you look at the visible surface of the sun. Uh, and those dark spots we call sunspots. And people have actually been counting the numbers of sunspots that the sun has uh, on a daily basis for long periods of time. So this is actually just going back over 150 years or so and you can see that the number of sunspots goes up and goes down, up and down, and up and down, and up and down, all the way on it. And it's roughly an 11-year period uh, of that activity going on. The sunspots start at the upper edge uh, towards the higher latitudes, so towards the polar regions, and then move into the equator, disappear, and then start again. Now, this is something that we've, we're studying. You know, we're still looking into this. Uh, you know, consider that the space age started in the, the 1950s and 1960s. So we've only had five full solar cycles where we've had spacecraft in space. You know, the high detail spacecraft, we sort of started launching in the late 90s. For a lot of these missions, actually trying to get to 11 years of operation can be quite tricky. And so building up big data sets to understand what's going on in the sun is not an easy thing to do. Uh, we've actually got programs where people are looking back at the old data and trying to say, well, how reliable is that? How can I look at those old sunspot records and confirm that that's the same sort of thing that we're looking at now? 
you know, if you think you, you have a camera, you know, 4K camera uh, on some of the, these modern spacecraft that are giving us phenomenal de detail on the surface of the sun, and then back then you had, you know, somebody projecting a telescope onto a piece of paper or a piece of film uh, or a plate and trying to, to, to note out where the numbers of sunspots were. Can you trust that those numbers are the same? You know, what we might see here is actually a group of five or six sunspots because we can see the detail. We didn't have that detail before, so what do we do? Do we say that's one or five when we give, get more information? So there's real issues of going back into the historical records, but we do have them and we can see what's going on. Now the thing with these sunspots is that these sunspots uh, and the number of sunspots uh, that we see can actually be related to activity on the sun. So as these sunspots emerge, they start to create little areas uh, that we call active regions. And these active regions, if you look at this one down here, change their brightness on very short periods of time. We call this solar flares. So we get this very short burst. This is actually only a, a day's worth of, of data. Uh, this whole movie as it runs through is one day. And you see these very short bursts of, of uh, activity. Uh, this is in the UV wavelength. We see this in x-rays. Uh, we can see this in some of the particle data as well. What this does is change our atmosphere. So we've got the sun shining all the time. We've got this sort of background of, of, of UV and, and X-rays and, and so on coming at us. And that gives us our lovely F region. But sometimes we get these bursts of, of more uh, UV coming out, more X-rays coming out. And that actually penetrates further down into our atmosphere and creates uh, regions at lower levels, such as the so-called D region. And I'm sure I probably don't need to tell any of you about D region absorption. The flashes on the sun, that activity that comes about from that plasma interacting uh, with itself, driving these flashes of activity on the sun, generate uh, this lower level of plasma in our atmosphere. And this lower level of plasma can actually absorb the radio signals before they get up to the F layer. And so they don't propagate around the world. And this is a real problem for us. This is a space weather effect. This is where the action on the sun causes an impact on what we're seeing on the ground. <coughs> I'm going to go back to this one. I actually took these images. I generated them a couple of days ago. Uh, but they were recorded on the 2nd of October. So this is flaring activity that our sun has been doing in the last week. This has been particularly uh, problematic because of the impact that it's had on, uh, on shortwave radio um, in the Americas. This is a simulation uh, by NOAA. Uh, I can't remember what the NOAA acronym stands for, but basically in America, these people are in charge of the space weather forecasts. Uh, and they have this uh, way of, of predicting what frequencies are going to get blocked out based on the activity that's going on in the sun. So what you have here, the color tells you the, uh, the, the highest frequency, which is going to be degraded by one decibel. And then up the side, you're seeing the attenuation of signals at lots of different decibels. And this is, I'll just run that again. So you can see when those flares go off, we suddenly get a loss of frequency, or uh, you know, greater absorption up to higher frequency. You can also see that the lower frequencies are much more absorbed as well. This is the sun affecting our use of radio technology. And this was particularly important because if you remember the news from uh, about seven days ago, we were talking about Hurricane Ian and the impact of that hurricane as it made its way up the eastern seaboard of the Americas, the impact on Cuba, the impact on, uh, actually, I think there was impacts all the way up to Canada. If you use radio as your emergency backup for communications during one of these things, and this sort of thing happens, then that radio can be cut out. It also impacts on GPS. You can end up blocking some of the GPS signals, or at least disrupting the GPS signals a little bit. 
And so if you're trying to work out where things are, where things are, where you need to get to, that can cause a problem. The sun is impacting on the use of that technology. So obviously, the thing that we want to do is be able to predict when that's going to be a problem. We want to be able to predict when the sun is likely to disrupt things. Because if you know it's coming, you can take mitigating action against it. And this is tricky. I said we've only had five real solar cycles since the start of the space age. We're looking at an object which is millions of miles away from us. We have got a spacecraft which is getting up close. It's getting within 10 solar radii of the sun. But that's about as close as you can really get at the moment because it's a hot environment, it's a hazardous environment. So all we can do in terms of understanding what the sun is doing is look at the sun and then try and model that with the physics that we understand. And one way we've been trying to improve that is through a mission that was launched just before the pandemic hit, ESA's Solar Orbiter. So this is a, a fascinating mission. It's been de in development for around about 20 years. The whole point of this spacecraft is to orbit the sun. It's in its name. Okay? We like things that are nice and simple to explain. Solar Orbiter orbits the sun. Solar Orbiter has instruments on board to look at the sun, to look at the, the different ap layers of the atmosphere of the sun, and it also has instruments on board to measure the stuff coming off of the sun. And if we can put this together, we can start to get a better idea as to how the sun works. We've already seen new and exciting results uh, telling us that the, the stuff coming off the sun acts in certain ways that we didn't really understand before. And what we're hoping is in the next few years, uh, that the orbit of the, the solar orbiter will be changed. So the plan is that solar orbiter will interact with Venus, it will do some gravity assists around Venus, and it will actually get out of the plane of the planets. It's going to get up, and it's going to start to look into the poles of the sun. This is really important. We've never had this observational view before. We've never been able to look down into the poles of the sun. We've tended to look at the sun either from the Earth or from spacecraft near to the Earth. And so you get a side-on view, which is great for some of the stuff that we want to do, but actually some of the interesting stuff happens in these polar regions. If we want to understand how the magnetic field in the sun is generated, the so-called solar dynamo that drives all of this activity that we see on the sun, then we need to get up so that we can look down on it and actually get measurements of that magnetic field that we can only measure remotely, and we really need a, a sort of straight-on view to see what's going on. So in the next few years, a solar orbiter will start to do this, it will, it will come up, and we will get this, this new view. And that's going to improve the way that we understand the sun, and that's going to help us to build the new models of predicting when these things might go on. Okay, so that's really the sun acting remotely on the Earth. It shines, it changes the atmosphere, it changes the radio uh, conditions. But that's not the only space weather effect of the sun. The sun is a giant ball of plasma, but it's a leaky ball of plasma. The sun is always losing plasma out into the solar system. In fact, that plasma, by the time it reaches the Earth, is traveling at of the order of 400 kilometers per second. So this stuff is whipping through the solar system. People often think that, that space is a vacuum. And actually, it's a pretty good vacuum. You know, up until a few years ago, going out into space was the best vacuum you could do. You couldn't actually get a vac better vacuum in a lab. Uh, we've, we've now surpassed that, but that's where we were maybe five, ten years ago. But there is stuff out in space. This plasma is out there, and we can go and we can see it. We can actually measure it. We can measure it in two ways. We can either put an instrument there in space and see this stuff, or we can actually see it by blocking out the light from the sun and looking at the light reflecting off of the stuff coming off of the sun, which is what we've done here. So we have the sun in the middle, and then these outer layers. What we've done is put an occulting disk. We've blocked out the light from the sun so that we can then see all the stuff that's coming off, and then we stack all of these images together to get this view uh, of the activity on the sun and the stuff coming off into space. 
Now that stuff is that plasma, and that's flying out into the solar system, and it's going to interact with anything that gets in its way. Plasma is stuck to the magnetic field. Remember that from the start. The, the magnetic field that the, the plasma was on to start with is where it is on at any given later time. And so that plasma is actually dragging solar magnetic field out into the solar system. And if it comes up against another magnetic field, say the magnetic field of the third rock from the sun, then it can't very easily get onto that magnetic field. It has to stay with the solar magnetic field. And so what we end up with is a whole load of plasma coming off the sun, flowing from the left-hand side towards me, impacts on the Earth's magnetic field and actually squeezes the magnetic field. If there was nothing else going on, it would just flow around it and go off out into space, creating this region around the Earth that we call a magnetosphere. This region is dominated by Earth's magnetic field. However, there is a trick. Remember the magnetic field of the Sun is also coming out. If the magnetic field of the Sun is in the opposite direction to the magnetic field of the Earth, then the magnetic field can come together, undergoes a process called reconnection, and we can start to open up this magnetosphere. The plasma can now flow along those field lines and get towards the Earth. And this happens, we build up a region of a magnetic field that is open, this stuff we call closed because it closes on the, the, the Earth at both ends. These regions we call open because it closes somewhere outside the picture that we tend to ignore. The reconnection continues, adds energy into the system and allows plasma along, and eventually we squeeze together the magnetic field at the back of the Earth, and we can close off that, those field lines that have been opened. But any plasma that was on this field line at that time is now trapped on a closed magnetic field line of the Earth. The Earth actually captures plasma from the solar wind, from all this stuff that's coming out of the sun all the time. The interaction between our magnetic field and the, uh, the, the magnetic field of the sun carried into space, the so-called interplanetary magnetic field, allows us to capture this plasma. And we build up these regions around us. We actually capture quite a lot of this stuff. And, and as it's captured, it's, it's heated. The plasma coming off of the sun has a temperature you know, maybe of a million degrees. By the time it's captured, we get it up to 12 million degrees. It then actually circulates through our magnetosphere, and that circulation heats that plasma up until we end up with a region of plasma, you know, the so-called Van Allen belts, quite close to the Earth, uh, sits just inside geosynchronous orbit, it gets up to 12,000 million degrees Celsius. This is really energetic particles that are orbiting the Earth, that are trapped on our magnetic field lines. There's not many of them. The density is low, but they are there, and they can have an impact on technology. We worry about the radiation belts, because these energetic particles can actually interact with spacecraft, get into the electronics, and cause all sorts of upsets. Now, what I've described sounds like a nice, simple cycle of things going through. You get reconnection on one side, you get reconnection on the other side, you get this nice cycle of plasma through the system. In fact, this was a cycle um, conceived by Jim Dungey uh, in the 1960s, the so-called Dungey cycle. Uh, Jim Dungey uh, ended up being a, a professor at Imperial College, uh, but the work on this he actually published when he was working for AWE uh, in Aldermaston. Um, but the idea of this, you know, this cycle going on uh, is the basis of what we think of the dynamics of, of, of this region of space, of our magnetosphere. But that's, again, not the end of the story. Because it turns out that this isn't necessarily a steady cycle. What we see is periods where we get build-up of energy. We maybe get reconnection happening here, but not out in the magnetotail, and then we get a burst of reconnection on the, in the magnetotail as the system tries to, to get rid of some of that excess energy within it. We call this a substorm. 
And if you're going on your, your trip to, to Iceland or Canada or whatever to see the aurora, this is what you want to happen. Because when this happens, you get the plasma that was trapped out here in space coming along the magnetic field, hitting the upper atmosphere, and causing the upper atmosphere to glow. We get plasma coming down into the upper atmosphere. We get currents into the upper atmosphere. We get this light show. But because we've got this plasma coming down into the upper atmosphere, we are also going to see changes to radio propagation. And in fact, you can bounce radio signals off the aurora. And I've, I've spoken to, to f colleagues of yours within the field who talk about the, 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 the raspy effects that you get if you bounce radio signals off the aurora. Um, we actually use the same sort of ideas to study the upper atmosphere. We can bounce HF signals off some of the uh, plasma irregularities that are associated with the aurora and actually work out how the atmosphere is moving. Now that's a sort of small kind of space weather. This happens maybe once every four to five hours, although occasionally we do see more of them and occasionally we see days without them. But this is a sort of fairly regular thing. You know, in terms of space weather or analogy with, with, uh, with, with weather, I'd call this a shower. Okay? This is the, the sort of everyday thing that, that you can just deal with. The big stuff is when we get the storms. Watch what happens down here. This is the sun. Again, this is about a day's worth of data. We've got that active region in the bottom uh, right-hand corner. It erupts, and it flings matter out into the solar system. This is mass being ejected from the outer layer of the sun. The outer layer of the sun is called the corona, and so this is a coronal mass ejection. Again, we like to keep things simple. This sort of activity is going to fling matter out into the solar system. We can see it again, where now I've got this, the data from the, uh, the coronagraphs where we've blocked out the, the light from the sun, and you can see that shape of that mass as it goes out into the solar system. This one, it turns out, wasn't Earth-directed, but we do get them coming straight towards us. And when they come towards us, they're bring, bringing a whole load of mass. They tend to be moving much faster than the rest of the solar wind, sometimes up to 2,000 kilometers per second. And they're bringing a whole bundle of the, Earth's, uh, sorry, of the sun's magnetic field with them. And that bundle of magnetic field can basically drive the Earth's system. We can get reconnection going on on the day side, on the night side, for very long periods of time, bringing in more and more plasma and energizing the system more. We can see this if we look at the radiation belts. The radiation belts are, are particularly susceptible to this sort of thing. Uh, so this is a, a simulation, uh, sorry, not a simulation, this is a, a representation of data from the, uh, from the radiation belts. And you can see that we get this, these dynamics. We see the radiation belt coming and going, and then as the storm hits, we get this massive amount of energy being added into the radiation belts. We're seeing more energetic particles there. Spacecraft are at a greater risk during these times. We also get more stuff coming down into the upper atmosphere. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the, the, the planetary K index, Kp, as an indication of geomagnetic activity, how much stuff the magnetosphere is doing. Uh, if it's not doing anything, then the auroral oval sort of sits at, at this average location, you know, somewhere over the, the bottom of Greenland, the north of, of, of Iceland, north of Norway, uh, Canada, and into Russia. As we get up to storms and we get this large amount of activity, the auroral oval comes down, and this is when the news outlets get really interested. This is when you see news in, uh, on the you know, newspapers and on your news website saying, go outside and look for the aurora. This is when the aurora comes down to these low latitudes, covering a much greater part of, of the, the space there as well. So we've got more stuff coming down. We've got stuff actually coming down to lower and lower latitudes. Again, this is a space weather effect where it's going to impact on things like radio propagation. Now, from an amateur point of view, that might be a good thing or a bad thing. You might be able to do interesting things off of this. From a, a, an operator's point of view, um, some of the, the aviation operators get quite wary about this sort of thing. We get enhanced radiation in this region, but we also potentially can block out the radio signals into the polar region. And so if you've got a transpolar airline route, you don't really want to be in a region where you can't get a radio signal out. You need to have that radio contact, 
And so the impact of the sun acting on this system is potentially going to change where planes have to fly, having that impact on our day-to-day -day lives. It's a wide range of effects. Space weather looks at all sorts of different things. So I, I've, I've talked about a few, and I've tried to talk about it in terms of, of the radio community and, and where the, the impacts are there. But we see impacts on things like power lines, on, um, on the oil industries, uh, we've talked about the airline industry, even into spacecraft and potentially impacts on astronauts as well. Space weather is, is now a, a, a well-recognized risk to what our, our, our day-to-day lives. Um, it appears on the UK National Risk Register. Uh, the, the impact of a major space weather event is actually listed up, um, and it appears in the same box as the risk and likelihood of pandemic flu. I'll leave that one hanging. <laughs> it's something that we're taking more and more seriously. And uh, as part of that, we're seeing funding into this. Um, the UK government has been funding a program called SWIMMER, the Space Weather Instrumentation Measurement Modeling and Risk Program, uh, where we're actually trying to take a lot of the science that we've been doing and turn it into forecasting tools for the UK Met Office. The UK Met Office is the owner of the risk for space weather in the UK. And so they're trying to build up their expertise and their capacity to be able to predict these things. And they're working with the scientific community to take that brilliant knowledge that we have uh, into the science of what's going on and try and make it work. The European Space Agency are doing a similar sort of thing. So they've been working with uh, groups around Europe uh, and trying to take that expertise, developing tools, and pull it all together so that people can get their, uh, get their information and understand what the risk is to them. Part of the difficulty of this is having people understand what the risks are. So we can't just make a forecast for, for, for one group of people. We actually have to understand where the potential risks are. And there's a, there's a little bit of cross-communication that has to happen, people explaining where they're exposed to risk. And we can then uh, predict what the, what the things that, that might be hazardous to them are. But it's coming. And we're starting to build up these tools. The last thing that I want to mention is the next new mission for space weather, VIGIL. So this is another European space weather mission. Um, this is going to give us an interesting side-on view as to what's happening. For space weather, we actually tried to do some predictions based on a, a spacecraft which is um, about, uh, I think it's 200 million kilometers uh, away from the Earth towards the sun, balanced at the so-called Lagrange point, uh, where the sun's gravity and the Earth's gravity balance out. You can actually put a spacecraft there and it will stay there and go around the sun at the same rate as the Earth, which means that you get somewhere between half an hour and an hour's warning of the stuff coming towards you. There is another Lagrange point, and that Lagrange point is actually slightly further round. Uh, it's around about, I think it's 60 degrees back in our orbit. Um, and if you put a spacecraft there, what it's going to see is as the sun rotates round on its 27-ish day rotation, the stuff that comes off, if you assume that that's roughly the same over a four or five day period, then Vigil is going to see that stuff hitting it first. But it's also going to have a side-on view of those CMEs coming towards us. And so we're going to be able to predict the arrival of time of those CMEs much better and then predict the potential impact from storms. So there's a hell of a lot of work going on in this community, uh, both in the UK and internationally. Um, I think it's a really exciting time for us to be studying space weather, but it is, uh, we know that it has these real day-to-day -day effects, uh, and that's why we want to try and understand it. If you want to find out more, um, then please visit the MSSL website. Uh, I can be contacted at the addresses on the screen. Thank you very much. Does anyone have questions for, uh, for Colin, Jenny? Hi, Colin. Thanks for a fascinating talk again. Um, you say we have uh, records of the sunspot activity going back quite a long time, and we all know about the Carrington event in 1859. Did that happen when the sunspots were low or high, or was there any correlation? I can't remember. I have a feeling 
that it wasn't at the solar maximum. So one of the things that we, we've been finding with the, the sort of extreme events is that they're fairly randomly spread out through a solar cycle. And I think the Carrington event was away from the peak. We do see with some of the flares, uh, and particularly with um, C-class flares, which are a slightly smaller flaring event, that there's actually quite a strong correlation between the number of sunspots and the number of flares that you get. But as you go to, to the high activity, w we still don't really know what causes that and why you might get a particular region which is particularly, you know, has a particularly large store of energy and released a particularly large event. So I think for the Carrington event, it was away from the solar maximum. I think it was into the declining phase of that. But I'd have to go back and, and check. But we, we can look at that, yes. Yes. Thanks a lot. Hello, thanks very much for the talk. It was brilliant. Um, perhaps you can answer a couple of things that have been dingling me for years. Uh, one is um, Fleming's law. Uh, so you have the lines of magnetic field going as you described. Why do the particles go along those lines? Surely they should go at right angles to them. So we have, so uh, you're, you're testing me back onto my physics. It's. Um, I was looking this up recently as well because I did a, PH, a PhD examination on it. It's that the Lorentz force acts on the particles. So we have um, th the velocity of the particle and the magnetic field, and it's the cross product of those that gives you a force which causes the particle to actually rotate around the magnetic field. Now, what becomes complicated is when you have more complex magnetic fields and you have diamagnetic effects and th those sort of things that come into it, where we tend to think about the background magnetic field as being dominant. And what we, we like in our physics is when one of the magnetic fields is much, much larger than anything else, and then we can basically ignore the little one and get on with the big one, and that gives us that, that, um, that, uh, that cyclical motion of particles around a magnetic field line. The other one, little teeny one, I hope, uh, is um, uh, what, what is it the reconnection of magnetic fields that gives rise to the uh, sudden ionospheric disturbance, the SID? What is that? I believe that's the solar flare effect, but I would, I would have to go back and check. I'm not trying to ask awkward questions. Yeah, no, no. I think it's been teasing me for years. Yeah, I, I think sudden effects tend to be, uh, particularly things that are happening in the ionosphere, are an ionization process, which is uh, that, that flaring on the sun giving you that, that burst of extra ionization. Um, uh, you know, one of those solar flares, if it lasts more than 30 minutes, it's classed as a long period event. So, you know, that's that re relatively sudden thing. And with, you know, the atmosphere then plays a role. So the, you get this ionization, but th that ionization is actually in a region where you've got quite a lot of neutral particles as well. And you can then get those charged particles and neutral particles bouncing into one another. You get um, neutralization of those those um, charged particles, and basically things go away. Um, so it can be a very short-lived effect in the upper atmosphere. Thank you, and thank you for your questions. They're brilliant. Uh, we just say goodbye to our uh, viewers on uh, on YouTube, and thank you, Colin, once again. I was thinking, that, you know, presumably. The F layer and the D layer have been around for millions of years, just waiting for someone to invent radio. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's the fascinating thing w with a lot of this stuff, is that it's been happening for for, for years. I mean, we can go back into the historical records, and people talked about, you know, the the aurora coming. You know, particularly when the aurora came down to low latitudes, and those those civilizations, you know, Germanic civilizations, uh, Chinese civilizations that weren't used to seeing them suddenly see this bright light in the sky, then that was a portent of doom or potentially a portent of something great happening. But, you know, most people tend to be a little bit pessimistic, so it's a portent of doom. Um, whereas civilizations, you know, further north, the Nordic civilizations, you know, linked it into the mythology of, of the Valkyrie and, and things like that. So, you know, all this stuff has been happening, but the, the impact of it, is reliant on us having that technology. And the more reliant we are on technology, the more expo exposed we are to, to what's going on. No, brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. Great. Well, we're going to stay in the atmosphere uh, in about... Uh
13 minutes because Jim Bacon will be here. I think Jim's in the room. Uh, hey, Jim. Um, and he's going to be talking about what the 2020s have told us about uh, uh, sporadic E. So stay with us for, uh, for Jim. Thank you very much.